I have a great show coming up for you tonight everybody. First up I've got Skip Bo from All Aussie Rescue. A really important subject about what you do when you find a dead marsupial on the side of the road. Australians, a must watch for you guys. Right after Skip Bo, I will be in the chat box talking to the Kangaroo Collective. Now don't go anywhere, we are going to start this show in a couple of minutes. Welcome to the Animals Television Show everyone. I'm your host Romy Bueller and I'm super excited for the next two week shows. We have Skip Bo from All Aussie Rescue joining us. Now next week he's going to be talking to us about his experience and involvement in the Australian bushfires in 2019-20. Tonight he has a really important subject. Amongst other subjects we cover a few things. But what would you do if you saw a dead kangaroo on the side of the road? Would you know how to check the pouch for a joey? Would you know how to remove the joey correctly? It's critical that you do. I've been around kangaroos my entire life and I haven't heard half of this information. So make sure you stick around for that. In the chat box segment, we're a little different tonight. I'm gonna to be talking to the kangaroo collective. So yes, you can talk to an individual animal. You can also talk to a collective or a species. Now the kangaroos want to talk to us about how they're feeling physically, what's going on with them, with the environment, and the, meat, the kangaroo meat industry and that type of thing. I'm coming up a little bit later. First up, I want to introduce you to Skip Bo. Skipo, great to have you on the show today. Welcome. And uh, I know, I can tell you 100% that we're not going to have enough hours to chat today. Uh, but it's really good to have you here. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us about all things wildlife. Uh, I'd love to start with a little bit, a day in the life of Skipo. Wh where did your passion come from for wildlife and and where are you at now? What are you up to? Yeah, so... Uh going back to the childhood days it was just uh, basically me and my mum and my sister 
And uh, mum was very animal oriented as well. We always had animals come and going. We'd always rescue stuff or mum would always be rescuing stuff. And uh, she kind of introduced us to the different animals. So when she was younger, she had Joey. She used to carry around. And uh, as kind of myself and my siblings has come along, we've kind of had that introduction to wildlife as well. Uh, the one thing she absolutely hated was snakes. Uh, so she had birds. <laughs> yeah. And so she had birds. And so from a young age, she would be like, nah, there's a snake in the aviary. I'd kind of give this shove. You're going in to get it. So from like the age of like 11 and 12, I was having to remove these uh, brown tree snakes and scrub pythons and carpet pythons from the bird aviaries and from the birds. So uh, that sparked my interest tenfold. And throughout high school, I'd always get in trouble. Um, I grew up in a, a remote area. So it was a real kind of rural bush school. Uh, I can remember sitting in classrooms and seeing snakes go past and I'd be like, stuff the teacher, I'm running out the door and I'd catch these snakes. And um, it was uh, really cool because my principal, uh, he loved snakes as well. So half the time I'd be skipping school or skipping class to go catch a snake and I'd go to the office and be like, oh, look at this spotted python I caught or look at this carpet python I just caught cruising past the, the classrooms and we'd kind of have a look at it and he'd be like, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. But yeah, very nice. And we'd go release it and I'd go back to class. And so that was throughout the high school. And uh, once I'd finished year 12, I ended up, ended up um, studying at the Agricultural College um, in North Queensland. And uh, from there, I was always out like photographing animals. During the day, I'd be uh, studying and doing um, prep stuff with conservation. At night, I'd be out photographing snakes and um, driving some of the most amazing roads in North Queensland, just seeing wildlife. And towards the end of uh, my studies, I kind of thought, well, what am I going to do? So I happened to just uh, walk into a zoo one day and uh, me and one of the guys that were at the Ag College and we're like, well, we need jobs. So we both said, oh, have you got any zoo jobs going in? Both gave the resumes across and uh, they're like, oh, funny enough, someone had just quit today. So they said, oh, would you like an interview? And we had an on-the-spot interview and we got a call back and uh, I was the lucky one. I got the job out of the two of us. And Perfect so, yeah, timing. that just, it was, it was brilliant. And, um, so from the age of, I was kind of almost 19 and so from the age of like 18, 19, I started working in the zoo industry and uh, kind of I just learned so much from starting out in a, a small little uh, wildlife park at the time was Hartley's Crocodile Adventures just north of Cairns and we uh, I was working with all different species and uh, soon enough I was in the reptile department and after a couple of years I was running the reptile department so it just kind of grew from there and I jumped around, I travelled around Australia, I travelled in the US, I got to volunteer and work in animal, with animals in the US and all around Australia. So I had the privilege of, yeah, getting to know and getting to see all these different species I've only ever seen in books. And I was there working with them and rescuing them and having a good time. And then wildlife rescue. Uh, well, I wasn't working with um, the zoo animals. I was um, doing wildlife rescue at nighttime. And uh, it was like 2007, I think it was, I first joined FNQ Wildlife Rescue. And from that point on, I've been involved quite heavily with wildlife rescue and and animals whether it be captive or or, or uh, wild so it's always been a part of my life i imagine that you would uh, not get a lot of sleep to is a, a lot of this work at night time or <clears throat> day so yeah look uh i sort of started specializing with um pink marsupials after a while so i went from um working and playing with big crocs and snakes to the smallest and most delicate of the the marsupials and so a pink marsupial is something that's uh well a definition of a marsupial is something that's uh the mums have short pregnancies they have a pouch um so they nurture the young with inside the pouch so as they're born after depending on the species anywhere from 12 to 30 days of pregnancy they're very undeveloped young in a pouch and they develop inside uh, it's the unfortunate part is before they have that chance to develop and and come out of the pouch and and they have the next stages of life we have all these injuries so um, when they come in pink they uh, they can't thermoregulate their body temperature they need feeding every two to three hours a day um, and it's not just daytime hours it's day and night so yeah sleep what's that <laughs> <laughs> yes i know how to spell it that's about it <laughs> yeah and look when you have like two and three pinkies uh, you're feeding every three hours so each some of the pinkies you might take like 10 15 20 minutes to feed just one so when you're feeding three and four or five or however many having care um that three hours is almost up before you're about to go back to the next feeding cycle again so yeah yeah for a yeah, period of time if you've got pinkies you don't sleep yes 
That's a huge commitment, isn't it? But a worthy one. And I know we spoke a few weeks ago as we were lining this up and and it's something that um, I think is worthy for the Australians, particularly uh, out there driving the back roads and perhaps have hit a kangaroo or wallaby or something like that. You spoke about um, how to be careful to check the pouches. Can you talk to us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so uh, this goes for any, if you hit them, if you hit the marsupial or if you're just driving along, um, if you find, found something on the road, it would be a kangaroo, uh, a wallaby, a koala, a possum, a betong, uh, a wombat even. So uh, with as many more species, but if you're driving along and you see something, um, I encourage everyone, it doesn't take too much out of your day to stop and go, oh, okay, he's got a good set of nuts hanging off the back of him. He doesn't need his pouch checked and keep driving. Um, if he doesn't have that appendage hanging in the back, you kind of, you, I really encourage people to look because um, I've pulled out so many uh, little joeys and the mums have been decayed and rotting. Uh, they stink, they're fly blown and there's still a, a live joey in the pouch and it's feeding wow. off mums rotten fluids. Um, uh, and in, in some cases, I've seen joeys lasting three, four, up, I'm going to say between four and five days inside the pouch. We're looking at how decayed some of these, um, some of the parent, uh, the mum is. So uh, if you do find a joey, um, you come across, you see uh, a little lump in the pouch. The ways in which you check it, uh, you don't just shove your hand in the pouch and just reef the joey out. It's going to cause a magnitude of problems for them. Um, so the best thing is you have a look inside the pouch. What I generally tell people, if it's furred, you can... Uh, if you can put your hand in the pouch, if your hand's small enough, you can actually manipulate the hind legs and the tail and just slowly pull the tail and the rump out um, and pull it out backwards, being careful of where the legs' positions are, uh, and then you can slowly pull it out that way. Um, if it is hard and the joey, which nine times out of ten, starts digging deeper and deeper into the pouch and does want to come out, um, and you have a knife or a pair of scissors on you, it sounds gory, uh, but you make an incision down the pouch, making sure the mum is actually dead first. Um, yes. cutting down the joey, which allows the, the pouch to open up a bit more and gives you a bit of a, a leeway of manipulating the joey out. Um, once it is out, you wrap it straight away. Um, it's not show and tell. You're not showing everyone on the highway, look at this little joey, look at this little joey. It's wrapping it straight up, putting it somewhere warm, quiet, calm, and getting straight to a wildlife care or making that phone call uh, before you get to them. If it's pink, this is where it can be a little bit delicate. Um, when the joey is born, it travels up the mum's uh, front of the body and into the pouch. Um, and as they latch on, some of these little joeys, uh, whether it be uh, jelly bean size for like a, a koala or a kangaroo or a wallaby, um, or even grain of rice size for some of the dazzurids, so the quolls and that kind of stuff, they have really small young. So as it comes up, they attach to the pouch and the power, uh, they, sorry, they attach to the nipple inside the pouch. And once the nipple is in the mouth, the nipple swells and that actually locks the joey onto the teat and it can't come off. So if you're putting your hand into the pouch and you're pulling, pulling the pinky out, it'll actually um, have, or it can have the ability to snap or cause serious damage to the jaw. Um, so what we tell people is if you've seen a pink joey inside the pouch, make an incision and cut down, being very careful not to cut the, the young inside. Open it up and then you're cutting with a knife or a pair of scissors the, the mum's teat off, but giving it quite a few mils or uh, 10 or so mils uh, so the, the nipple doesn't go inside the joey's mouth. So once you've cut the teat off, um, and if you can, like a, like a bobby pin or a safety pin through and, um, and put it on so it can't actually be ingested, um, and then you're getting that little pinky and putting straight in somewhere warm. Now, what I always encourage, and it can sound wrong, but for ladies, and I, I do it too, shove it straight down your top. Um, if you've got a bra, perfect. It's the closest warm spot. It's right in the heart. Your, your chest is really warm. Um, and the, the pinky joey, you're looking at around 34, 35 degrees. The human body's around 36. So... Oh, 36, 37. So it's uh, the most optimum temperature. It might get a little bit warm for them and you'll feel them wriggling around, but you just kind of move them around and keep it there. Um, if they cool down too quickly and they cool right down, um, there's a high chance of going to hypothermia and dying. Uh, so you need, really need to keep these warm. The next part to this is it's not for you to take home and think, I'm going to give this a crack. I'm going to learn how to do this because you're going to kill it. 
Uh, most people bring it straight home, chuck it straight on the cow's milk. They're highly lactose intolerant and then they're dead. Um, what I encourage people when they come through and they say, oh, can we keep it or can we learn how to do it? I encourage them to sign up to a wildlife rescue organization and get the correct training. And then once they do that, I generally take them under my wing. I guide them through and how to uh, care for the offspring. I give them something easier to start with and then we raise them on from there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's critical when taking these joeys out of the pouch, it's done correctly. Um, and it's not hard and there's a lot of stuff on the internet and there's a lot of stuff on wildlife rescue pages on the, the step by step and there's generally a 10 step process, but I've kind of amalgamated a lot of that together and how I've spoken about it. Yeah, that's, that is such good information. That is so valuable. I, I wouldn't have even, I'm from the country. We had kangaroos around as one of my favorite animals and, um, you know, it's not something I've ever heard, ever been taught. I don't know anyone, um, that I know that probably has either. Uh, so that's really great information, especially for, um, you know, the Australians that get in and around those areas where kangaroos, and they're getting closer to the city areas too. So, you know, it's not just being on a rural road or out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I imagine too with the little animals that you, you know, you should have your first aid kit with your, with your bobby pins and your torches and all that sort of thing in the car, shouldn't you? So um, with the little animals that have like the rain, grain of rice, you really need to be getting in there and having a good look because you could very easily miss a little bit. The hard thing you. is, uh, it's actually really interesting with uh, some of the calls and Dazirids, uh, like even the devils. Uh, I think it's the devils will produce up to 50 offspring um, in one right. litter um Ooh. all 50 fit on a 50 cent coin um and it's survival of the fittest from day dot it's i think there's only six teats or something like that so it's the first six or so in they attach the rest they die um right. and it's the same with the quoll so um there is also if a pinky is too small we have to look at the viability factor um and this is where the harsh reality of a wildlife care or a person really has to kind of understand that um if you've got something that is not as developed there's a higher chance it's going to be susceptible to everything it's not going to form properly and we kind of work off a rule of um, certain weights with um, certain marsupial species when we euthanize when we keep viable um, and it's the harsh reality but sometimes we do have to euthanize something when it's too small Yes, yes, of course, um, the practicalities of life, unfortunately. But, you know, you were talking before about, um, or before we kind of came on air, about people wanting to take in the kangaroos and the, the cute little animals as their family pets. So when uh, I, I run training through F&Q Wildlife Rescue and, um, and encouraging and talking to people because a lot of people think they're doing the right thing and they, they are, they're doing the right thing and they're taking these animals, they're rescuing them. They might do the correct job, but there's a big thing with um, rehabbing an animal correctly to have them be able to be released back in the wild. So they're not human dependent. Um, and this is when um, I see it with many other wildlife rescue groups. And I'm not here to say they're doing this wrong, they're doing this wrong, but you do see it where people are, they'll take these joeys to bed with them and they'll sleep them in bed and they'll, they'll let their kids run around and carry them and they'll have the kids play with them and, or they'll play with them or they'll chuck them in their bag and carry them around like a fashion accessories through shopping centers and all that kind of stuff where they should be left at home and not um, exposed to the real life world. So mm. it's people doing things, um, I guess, properly. And this is what needs to happen, not just people grab an animal and just raise it and you'll be right and let it go and it gets out of the wild and has no no chance. Yeah, because as best as possible, you want them to go back into the wild, don't you? you know, if they can't be, that's a different scenario. But as much as you can, they're being rehabbed to go back to their place of, of living. Exactly. That's yeah. our biggest as rehab and release. It's not rehab and keep as pets, mm. rehab and release. Yes, everybody out there, rehab and release. No excuses. Yep. If you had three things that you wanted people to do or to know or to do better at, what would, you, what would your top three be or your top one or your top five? Or? I think it's in everyone's, it's, no, no one's, it's in some people's nature is to bring other people down instead of nurturing what they have. And what I see um, 
a hell of a lot is some wildlife rescue people getting jealous and say, oh, that person's getting that animal and that person's getting that animal. I want that. So they'll try and bring them down. Um, or if one person's stuffed up and they've done something wrong and that uh, people see it, they these people and target them and bring them down and be like, they shouldn't look after animals. They did this wrong. My biggest thing is working with people to try and build them up instead of pulling them down. Um, so awesome. that would be one thing would be to for people to work with each other not against each other if we all mm. work together the outcomes would be like huge we would have so yeah. many more uh, amazing outcomes than what we are now because people i don't think are working with each other effectively so mm. that would be one yeah. um people being conservation minded it's kind of hard some people aren't conservation minded some people are, uh some people are just playing out selfish but um people being uh more conservation minded in what they do um so whether it be recycling uh for one around the house which then gets rid of landfill um uh so it's just i guess environmentally friendly would be i guess better than conservation minded but between the two i saw one of your videos about litter up up north there on, on one of your um adventures you are on what sort of problem are you seeing with that within the the oceans obviously in the bushland and, and around your area litter isn't just up north it's it's everywhere in australia it's everywhere in yes. the world um yeah and look if you go through anything like to say um unfortunately through like go through indonesia and it's absolutely appalling um but i'm not going to point fingers at any kind of countries and what they do but everywhere i go um and the people i go with i encourage them to pick up like five or six pieces of rubbish um i'm not asking them to clean the environment up and make it spick and span and clean everywhere they go pick five or six pieces of rubbish up and dispose of it correctly. The videos that you saw, I was doing, a, I did a month trip around the Cape and I was looking at all um, throughout Cape York. And I think in uh, my experiences, Cape York has some of the most magical sites anywhere around Australia. Um, there's some very unique places up there and because it's forward drive access, it's not as, um, it's not as well traveled as many other places around Australia, but there are, some people that ruin it for others and they'll just chuck a beer can out the window a coke can here or something else there so or plastic rubbish that kind of stuff so it's just picking up that kind of rubbish i know there was one place up there where there was um uh, it's called five beaches uh i had a look at the rubbish and unfortunately there was a significant amount of rubbish on closer inspection barely any of it was australian it was all foreign rubbish right. that had come down through coastal currents and just ended up on these beaches so uh, one, it's sad because sat in the ocean has travelled that far, but um, two, it's then coming onto Australia's um, land and I guess making it not as nice. So going through and picking all this rubbish up and cleaning it up is what I kind of like to do. And that's what I'd like to encourage people to do as well. So no matter where you are, just pick up five or six pieces of rubbish, chuck in the back of the car or you carry a bag in the car with you and dispose it when you get home. Or if not, even better, you can recycle it somewhere. Chuck your cans in if you're the states you live in, have a ten dollar fee, uh, ten cent fee for your cans. Try and recover some of that money. I'm big on We like to walk past up. stuff, I think. We 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 know it's there but we don't see it anymore. So I think um I think we need to observe a little bit more with the doing Definitely. action part of picking up and, and disposing. Any wild encounters, anything any stories to tell before one last story before we finish off? <laughs> Scariest oh. animal? Anything? I'm sure you got plenty. Are well, you probably not scared of anything? Are you? <laughs> um, it's funny you say that. Um, I, as a, a kid growing up, I was good with any animal to come across. Um, absolutely hated spiders. Highly arachnophobic. <laughs> I'd handle snakes. Handle anything to come across. Uh, I remember as a 16 year old um a <laughs> big spider was in the bathroom <laughs> i ran out <laughs> naked and we're like mom you get in there and kill that spider and so i had this just it was disgusting phobia spiders i didn't want to do it my first uh my very first job in a zoo um i it was working all with wildlife it was working in with uh it was venomous creatures and i was doing um milking of venomous snakes and spiders and that kind of stuff and I got asked if I'd like to come on board and work. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'd love to. Like young, young gun fired up, ready to work with animals and got straight in there and thinking, oh yes, I get to work with snakes and I get to milk snakes and there's something new that I can learn. And I was like, you're working with spiders. <laughs> it's a punishment. The fear and just the loathing of my, what the hell am I doing? 
and yep i was like nah stuff this i don't want to work with this but no, i kept going and uh on one of the first first or second day uh one of the other tour guys left uh he was doing a tour of the some of the spiders and he'd left one of the um tarantula enclosures open and the tarantula came out and was walking down oh. in between this crowd my boss was like catch that spider and i was like no way not touching it not going there and he's like catch that spider and i was like no not doing it and then um yeah i got out and i uh, went picked this spider up and away i was like oh it's disgusted and um and he's like that's it you're not going home until you handle every single spider in this place it's in your hand you're picking up all these scorpions you're oh. learning how to do this you're learning how to do that and i stayed back for a good hour or two picking tarantulas up putting tarantulas down picking up other spider species putting them down picking up scorpions um and that's how i learned to become non-arachnophobic yes good i would so, have had therapy after that i think so you actually I, are okay with spiders now is that really yeah I, I, I actually love i love spiders <laughs> uh my other half hates them but i love them so any spiders in the house i turn pick up and take out yeah which we're yeah, lucky sounds... where we live we've got we've got the goliath tarantula where we live so it's this beautiful big um hairy spider essentially and there's got heaps of them around the property so um it's really oh, cool right. to see them what is it called a hairy goliath no it's called the goliath tarantula oh god jeez how big is that they're, um yeah they're big um big dinner plate so like they sit in your hand like, plate? Oh, yeah, okay. big. yeah no yeah a thumbnail size is big enough i reckon yeah <laughs> <laughs> i have a slight issue too. with spiders myself um, my dad used to do the bedroom scour before I went to bed every night to make sure there was nothing in there <laughs> or to remove whatever was. So I'm, I'm on your a, page. I went to do a 1 a.m. feed the other night and I was like half asleep and I was walking down the hallway. I looked down and I thought, oh, what's that bit of rubbish in the floor? And then I had a second look and I actually had one in the house. It was huge. Oh, um, uh, <laughs> it was sitting right outside my joey room and i was like oh, 1 a.m in the morning i don't feel like catching a huge big tarantula and taking it outside but got the container and the piece of paper scooped him up and released him outside i'll never oh, i'll never really? kill him i'll always release him outside yes no and they would be thankful for that what what is their purpose in life what are they here to do oh, if i think if like i was i think i heard something if you took all the spiders out we'd drown in the insects uh, oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know how true that kind of thing is, but it sounds pretty damn good. So yeah, I like to live yeah. with that. They control the insects, and we can live with them. Okay. All right. I'm I'm liking it. I like what I hear. Uh, Skippo, absolute pleasure to have you in my room today, or in, uh, in my on air room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have learned so much from you, and one day let's hope we can get you back here because this is really fascinating stuff, and everyone needs to be educated on all the what's, why's, hows on the wildlife front and conservation and the environment and all those sorts of things so thank you so much it's been fantastic don't go anywhere everybody we're going to be back in the chat box in just a moment chat box everyone thanks for joining me in this segment tonight now this week and next week is going to be a little bit different to how we've been doing this previously if you've watched any of the earlier episodes you would have noticed that we've been talking to our more domesticated animals dogs cats horses we even had a ferret in one of our earlier episodes but in line with talking wildlife I thought it would be interesting and somewhat appropriate to speak with one of our native Australian animals so I sent out the energetic invitation to see who wanted to jump on in for a chat. Pun intended because bound on in they did. We're on kangaroos tonight. They were coming in from all directions so they obviously have something to share with us. Now animal communication is something that I do within my work and people seem to think for some reason that you need to be special. That it's a gift or a talent. Well, I can tell you now, it's not a talent and it's not a gift. It's actually our natural state of being. We all have this innate ability to communicate this way. Our ancestors and ancient cultures have been communicating this way forever. But somewhere along the line, people started to think that this was all a bit of nonsense, that it was weird or wrong. And we uneducated ourselves around the idea of working intuitively. Some of us don't even know that this exists. 
We can talk to an individual animal, we can talk to a group of animals, and we can talk to a species. And tonight, I'm talking to the conscious collective of the kangaroo. I'm often talking to wildlife because I'm very interested to hear from their perspective how they're faring in this world, the world that we've created for them, and it's not all peaches and cream. I want to know what they need from this, from us, how they feel, whether they're happy. And I like to learn from them, so I might ask them things like, how do they deal with stress? Because as we know, animals are our greatest teachers, and if we just sit back and listen, we can learn a lot from them. Communication with animals is where we send energetic messages or impressions between each other. It's called telepathy. And we send information through images, feelings, thoughts, and sometimes tastes and smells as well. When I first connected with them, they wanted to share with us what their biggest threats were. And this will come as no surprise to anyone. Their biggest threats are man and poisons. They are extremely scared of us right now. They are fearful of man like they've never feared us before. And with that fear comes digestive unease within them. I found this interesting. They're very happy to sacrifice themselves as a food source, but on an as needed basis which is where it all goes wrong because there's so much greed and gluttony around the kangaroo meat industry and they're really unhappy about it. They're unhappy about the brutality and the barbaric way they're being hunted down and killed. Actually, they've just changed that word to murdered. They see this more as murder than just killing. It's like there's a testosterone fueled anger behind the way they're being murdered and they're being killed as sport without love, compassion and kindness behind why they're being killed. They're upset about that and they want it to change. And I guess forever the optimists, they believe it can, uh, but it's gonna take a whole lot of effort for that to happen. There is a whole lot of noise behind some of the groups of people that are trying to make that change now. And I hope they keep pushing that cause because it's a worthy one. The other thing they wanted to talk about as their threat was poisons and chemicals and things that are coming through the wind, it's in the soil, in the rain, in the drinking water. And what they're showing me here is their whole body is changing. I feel this burning sensation in my throat, like an acid burn. My digestive system feels unwell. There are cancers that they haven't had before. There's unusual growths. There's some neurological disorders coming through as well, which this is sad too, um, because what I actually see here is that they're struggling to hop as the nervous system can't tell the body how to hop and what to do. How sad is that? They're a kangaroo, that's what they do. Their sense of smell is changing. Their respiratory systems are being compromised. It's not as easy to breathe anymore as it was. And with that too, I'm also getting shown um, when the mothers are feeding their joeys that the milk is very toxic. And so a lot of these problems are gonna start coming through the joeys at birth. I'm getting shown them standing facing the sun and I feel this in a meditative kind of way. Not just meditative, I also feel like it regenerates and heals the parts of the body that need healing. They have a message for us. Two things. Firstly, they want us to find different outlets to move anger and not to use them as the release. They also want us to better understand the interconnectivity of the natural world and to see that we are one thread of the weave, that we are not the entire weave. One final thing they showed me, which was really interesting and extremely useful, but it doesn't seem to work this way, is that they can completely dissolve their energy fields, making themselves invisible, which would be great for when they're being hunted. But the problem is that fear stops them being able to activate this rather useful feature. The themes of these conversations I have with animals is always the same. It's not just kangaroos that are feeling the strain. Um, my view is that I believe we need to feel more, we need to learn more, we need to behave better. And as humans, we need to step down from our we are better than all pedestals and do a whole lot better than we are. Now that's the end of our show, everyone. Come back next week and see what native Australian animal we have in the chat box. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow the pages, Instagram, Facebook, the website, and don't forget to share with your family and friends. Thanks again for watching. I'm Romy Bueller. I will see you back here next week. I drove through this burnt out forest and it's probably that I was told was like one of the, the hottest fires had gone through, so everything was just destroyed. And I drove for hours through this bushland and to me, I could tell it was 
really bad because one, I couldn't even find a single live insect. Mm. I didn't see a single animal and it was just me out in the this burnt out bushland with nothing. 